but Paul knows you better. <laughs> Thanks, David. <laughs> I said we were loose. So I'm sitting we here thinking I got off scot free. Um, <laughs> What can uh, I say you know, about you know me, Paul. You don't need a formal, too much of a formal. No, no, I don't, and I, I won't be very formal. I'll speak about Louise as a friend and a, a colleague. Um, Louise has uh, uh, quietly, with humility and with determination and real skill and expertise, I would say, transformed acceptance and commitment therapy, acceptance and commitment training. Uh, through a series of books and um, continuing work to publicise uh, more evolutionarily based, more um, uh, practically based models of acceptance uh, and commitment training and really just how to live. Um, so uh, I've greatly appreciated Louise's numerous books and um, I can say that uh, Louise embodies, when you look around the community of people that are uh, developing these ideas, there, there are some that stand out as just an embodiment of the work. And I would say Louise is one of those. So um, I'm greatly looking forward to this talk, Louise. Thank you, Paul. Should I just start? What a lovely introduction. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thank you so much. That was great. So uh, yes, please start. Um, I do have some slides because I think that will guide the talk a little bit. Um, and um, I try not to make it too formal. There's plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. But I thought I'd start right where it's important to me, and that is context. And originally in the title of this talk, I said I was going to talk about young people. But I've changed that and I'm going to talk about all people because one of the things that happens when you talk about young people is people who don't work with young people stop listening. So I changed the talk and decided we would make it about all of us. But I'm going to begin with talking with you just a little bit about how my week unfolded because I think it's relevant to all of us. And so... <clears throat> Early in this week, I had a call from a very dear friend, Carly, who is a clinical psychologist and I supervise Carly. <clears throat> and she said, Louise, have you got an hour for consultation? And when I got on the phone to Carly, she began by saying they had had their third suicide in the community in this week. And um, this particular one was a young person that was very close to Carly. And she did give me permission to talk about her, her work. And um, we talked about where we are at with young people. And this is Australian data. This is the Australian Bureau of Statistics data from 2020-2021 on the mental well-being or mental health problems of across age and, oh, just dropped my water bottle, across age and gender. And what um, is really shocking to me is that almost 50% of females under the age of 24 are struggling and 32% um, of males. And if you look at that data, it bears it out across the world. It's not just Australian data, but I have come back to this slide for more than a year now, and I keep coming back to it, and I just think, goodness me. So when Carly was on the phone, I, I showed her this, and I said, this is our problem. If we have this plant, and it looks like this, we always know what to do. We don't look at that plant and wonder what's genetically wrong with it or why, it, why it's not growing properly. And we definitely don't blame the plant. We know immediately that we have to think about its nutrients, the water, the sunlight, where it's growing. And we looked at this plant and I said, Carly, this is our problem. This is the work we have to do. Is when we see data like this, what we do is we respond by saying they need to see more therapists. 
and they need more I- I- internal, you know, therapy. And we need to work on how to help people see a psychologist or whatever profession. And I'm not saying that we don't need to do that, but we just don't take this perspective. We just don't think, how is this person growing? In what is the circumstance in which they're growing? How much connection do they have with other people? How much nutrients do they have? What's um, feeding them? And the work that we do is deeply contextual. And we know when we look at, and the work I'm going to talk to you about today, when we look at contextual behavioural science and when you folk look at pro-social world, you know that if you're going to make things grow, you need to look at the whole picture. And you need to nurture that community and take that multi-level view. David, your, your book, This View of Life, I've used so many times for looking at the way we scale up all these multiple levels. But we don't do that when we're looking at an individual in front of us. We instead look for diagnoses and labels and what's wrong with this person and how do I help them think in a better way or feel in a better way. So Carly and I talked about this and um, Carly runs a not-for-profit. She's also given me permission to show this. Carly runs a not-for-profit in her community that has struggled with some mental health problems and some um, other issues. And she runs a not-for-profit and she, she manages to draw in with her colleague, Tammy, 18 um, psychologists who are on um, internships. And she supervises them all. They do it all not-for-profit and they have them all in different schools and they're building this enormous community. And they use my work, DNAV, and they use pro-social world and they can't get funding. So everything is done on the smell of an oily rag. So that was the way my week began, which was kind of appropriate for a pro-social talk. But after Carly and I spoke, the next day she sent me this text message. And it says, you might, the writing's a bit small, it says today's group supervision. So as a group, she brought in this pot, this plant, put it on the table, and as a group, this is their task to try to work out how to turn around and get support for a community that really needs it. And so I know that pro-social is doing that, and I really think that we, what we need to do is find a way to extend that message more and more to the people like me, mental health professionals, who don't always listen. Um, and I know that that work is being done. So I wanted to set that kind of context as I begin to talk about becoming pro-social from the inside out and um, adapting the work that, you, that I do into the work that you do um, in the pro-social world to try to think about how we can um, just get stronger and better at it. And so... Um, there's the books that I have I'm going to, um, that talk to this work that I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the problem and some a little bit about pro-social world, a little tiny bit about the extended evolutionary meta model. But mostly my talk is going to be about this little baby um, that Joseph Cherokee and myself created about 15 years ago that we called DNAV. And it's an application of contextual behavioral science. And as Paul said, more broadly, evolutionary work um, and ways that we can use all of those um, science principles to think about how we grow and adapt. And most of the work today comes from um, the recent book that we released last year, which is for adults, um, which is a lay person's read called What Makes You Stronger. So I'm going to talk about that and I'm going to talk about this little thing that we call the disc and how that can help with your core design principles. <clears throat> um, and I've got them mapped on here, but it's not exactly a one-to-one -one correspondence. It's more like a, oh, I think this is where they fit. And as I was preparing this talk, 
I'm I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna name someone. As I was preparing this talk, I was speaking with Jim Lemon, and I'm sure many of you know Jim in Scotland, who does brilliant work, um, in my opinion. And I said, Jim, I need to give a pro-social talk. What should I do? Um, I need to talk about DNAV. And Jim said, you need to tell them how pro-social would be better if it had DNAV in it. <laughs> I said, all right. So for those of you who don't know, Jim uh, works in um, paediatrics in Scotland and heads up a, um, a paediatric psychology service that runs across the hospital. And they use this work with patients, children who are patients, with the parents, with the medical team, and um, with everybody across the whole hospital. They use this work. <clears throat> So Jim said, oh, you absolutely need to tell pro-social world why they need DNAV. So, all right, Jim, I'll do that. So what I thought I would do in this talk is um, help you see how I would unfold some of these things and hopefully make it fairly easy and low level um, to think about. So as I think about... Um, what happens, I'm going to ask you a question to think about. What does it mean to be human now? What does it mean to be human now? If we look at what's happening, and where we've been the last few years, And where we are now, these are the floods in New South Wales just earlier this year, and we all know how tall a McDonald's sign normally is. <clears throat> and of course, the devastation that we see across the world. When we look at what it means to be human now, it, I and I and you, of course, we all do feel such a sense of despair. And if we look at World Health Organization data on our mental well-being, the um, who reported that we missed the 2020 mental health targets, and they've set new targets for 2030. And their primary conclusion was a disappointing picture of worldwide failure to provide people with mental health services. And the data from 171 countries gives a clear indication that the increased attention given to mental health in recent years has yet to result in a sale up of quality mental health services that is aligned with the needs of the people. And I think that is because we spend too much time focusing within the individual as mental health professionals on how to provide more treatment. Not that that's not needed, but alone it's not enough. Because these, these rates that we see just keep rising. When I started as a psychologist, it was one in four. Now we're looking at one in two. It just keeps going up. And we know from the research um, that if you keep providing individual treatment and medications, we won't answer the problem. So when I look at what's going on, the first thing I think is, and this is a, a, that little tiny disc that we call DNAV, it's just extended out to make it able to write on it. The first thing I think is, what do I deeply care about? And what do we deeply care about? And I've just written my response. I want a well world and I want to look after the future and the people that are in it. And so when I'm in a well world, I'm in the physical world as well as, the, and then looking after the future and looking after the people that were in it. So if we continue to unpack a little bit more of the data, we know this is who data from that report, women and young people are the worst hit. <clears throat> and what it means to be young right now is escalating. This is who data, I won't read it, but it bears out the same 
um, as that Australian data that I showed you before. <clears throat> and this is a Belgian study, which I like because the way of the way they put the odds ratios together. And what I think is the most startling is if you look at the highest odds ratio for mental distress, it's loneliness. And increases in social media use. And we know young people are the loneliest they've ever been. And we feel this social and disconnection. We do it too. Adults do too. And if you look at the WHO um, response, why we missed the target, lack of progress in leadership, governance and finance. Transfer of care to the community is slow and questionable effectiveness in mental health promotion. So then before I continue, I would ask you to think about the answer to this question. What really matters to you? What do you want? What is, and the reason we have this in the middle is, and I always talk to people about what is in your heart? What matters to you most? What's the thing that you care about? <clears throat> so we'll go with my, my what matters to me most. And when I look at all this data and when I look at what's happening across the world and then what happens, I often refer to as the dark side. <clears throat> so the dark side. A stands for advice, which is just another word for the way we talk to ourselves. So my dark side, I immediately respond with people are selfish. Money will always win. It's too big a problem. I'm just one person. How could I make a difference? This is my immediate response to looking at all of this data that I've set the scene with. What's your response? What are your thoughts and your judgments and evaluations when you see where we were at, where we are at? On the dark side. More dark side. N stands for noticing, and it's about how we respond with our bodies and our feelings and our emotional awareness. And so I respond by feeling angry and frustrated and sad, and then I get reactive. the dark side. And then D stands for what we do or what we discover. Then what I do next is I avoid it or I indulge too much in things that I shouldn't be indulging in or I just focus on me. And then at the back of this, you'll see that this these front uh, four pieces, this disc that we call it, rests inside two really important contexts that are like a container for these four abilities. And those two containers are the social context and the self context. So <clears throat> when all of this is going on in me, when I know what I care about and I feel like I'm not able to do anything about it, I feel socially disconnected and alone and in terms of myself my sense of efficacy is low so I refer to this as the dark side and we talk a lot about that because it's really important to know what our immediate responses are and to be able to talk about that so this is just my response so then if we look at the who's call to action Deepen the value and commitment we have to mental health. Reshape environments. That's the pro-social world piece that you folk are doing so well. And strengthen mental health care by changing where, how, and who we deliver it to. It's very pro-social, isn't it? So now I'm going to flip it over and show you how DNAV, this model we call DNAV, is one example of how to take ourselves from this place into a place where we're starting to move to that call to action. And then I'm going to come back to your core design principles that you use in pro-social world. So we think of DNAV as one framework that brings together all of our human abilities 
and rests them inside a context of our social connections, never without looking at our social connections, and our self, because that, as individuals, that influences how we use it. So they're two really important contexts. So I usually make a joke that this framework looks like we thought it up over a couple of beers on a Saturday afternoon because it's really simple and it's simple to apply. And I show you a little bit about what's underneath it. Not too much theory, but just a little bit. This is um, the extended evolutionary meta model or the AIM it's, as it's being called um, by uh, Joe Cherokee, Steve Hayes, Stefan Hoffman and colleagues. Um, and it is a way of looking at all human abilities and dimensions across the evolutionary principles of variation, selection and retention in context. These map perfectly onto DNAV. So what this aim does is look at the ways in which the principles you folk know of, of variation and selection and retention, can be mapped to human processes like our cognitions and our attention and our motivation <clears throat> at different levels, sociocultural and biophysiological. And this does the same thing. It's just an easier way to apply it. And so inside DNAV, we based our work when we started 15 years ago we started basing DNAV on how young people adapt and grow. And so inside that, we ended up looking at principles like why a teenager is, takes risks and how evolutionary science can help us understand that. Um, and it did. It, we looked at play and adaptation and the way humans take risks and how they grow. And we built this, this little theory based on that. And look at it, looking at all of the ways in which we as humans are able to vary our behaviour or continue to choose narrowed behaviours, select them and repeat them. <clears throat> and we used contextual behavioural science to look at what DNAV really looks like. At the broadest level is functional contextualism which simply means always looking at what's going on inside the context. <clears throat> um, we look at evolution, evolutionary principles. Then we looked at theories that are based on selection by consequences, such as biological threat and safety. How my, my very being, my physical being, has learned to respond in the world to someone near, near me whether I'm able to connect with others and feel soothed by others or whether I feel others are a threat. Attachment theory, operant principles, relational frame theory, all selection by consequences. And then we looked at processes that have evidence to come up with our framework. And what this actually really looks like is four abilities that all of us have as humans. So every behaviour that a person does, I can map onto one of these. They're loose categories. They're not experimental, but they're really pragmatic and practical. You all have these four abilities. The valuer is a word just to describe creating a context to empower ourselves to care. To connect with the human need that we have for wanting things to be a certain way and deeply kept mattering about things. The advisor is a word we use to describe our verbal ability to navigate all of our past and all of our future and to use things like rules, beliefs, judgments and evaluations and problem solving. The noticer is a word we use to describe our embodied awareness the way we use our body, our senses, our awareness, across the context of within me and outside of me. And whether we are reactive or whether we respond with awareness. 
and the discoverer. Sometimes we use the word doer because people get confused, but I like discover what we do, what we do out in the world, how we repeat our patterns of behavior, how we learn new behaviors, how we try and learn new things. And our task with DNAV is to know that every single person has these four skills and to learn how to be more skilled so that we can use them in a way where we put our energy into what matters. Because if I go back to this one, when I'm in this place, which is why I call it the dark side, I'm not putting my energy into what matters. I'm putting my energy into feeling outraged. And sometimes I can use that for what matters, but here I'm not because I'm avoiding it. I'm turning away. I'm disconnecting from other people. I'm not using that. I'm not channeling that energy into helping what really matters. So what we want to do with DNAV is find a way to help people use their four skills. And we do play on the DNA as a, a, a metaphor for the four abilities you have are just like we all have DNA in our cells. We all also have DNAV in our um, abilities. So we use that kind of metaphor to play on it. So we want to help people use their abilities to channel them towards things that matter and to do that inside the context of the social world. So I thought I'd walk you through a little bit about how you or I, or anybody that I might be working with, might learn to channel their energies into what matters. To recognize and talk about the dark sides that we go to and to turn to channeling our energy into what matters. And to do that, what we use is processes that are evidence-based. So I'm not going to describe them too much today, but I just want to flag that they're there. So if we're using something like acceptance is an evidence-based process. So we use processes that are evidence-based and we put them all inside this framework and we can continue to make this framework as big as we need to do. And we look at the whole person in their social context, in their environmental context. So I thought I'd walk you through that in a practical kind of way so that the folks who are listening might think about how it might help you in your pro-social worlds. <clears throat> so let me go through one at a time. The valuer is about trying to create a space, a context where we empower people to think about what they care about and to channel their energies into that. And what I mean by creating a context you do this in your pro-social. When you come together as a group with a common purpose, you all feel empowered because you're there together. And so we want to be able to do that in every space that we work in. I often talk to mental health professionals and I talk about what is the context in which you do your work? And what I mean by that is what, is, what does the person feel like they're there for? What do they think they're there for? And the context is more often than not a context in which we're trying to get rid of a problem. That's not empowering. What we want to do is we want to push that elephant aside and see what's on the other side of that problem and start to think about what brings you energy, engagement, vitality. And a point to note, we use vitality and value because vitality is a bridge. I don't have time to explain that very much today, except your momentary energy and engagement becomes a bridge to vitality. And so what we want to think about is being able to do that in every single day, not with the big V value, but using our smallest moments of energy, like a group coming together or us coming together for this talk. And what we notice is that as humans, when we think about what matters, when I think about trying to change the world or trying to change mental health for people or trying to make a difference, it's such a big thing that it feels like I don't have time to do that right now. 
I need to wait until I've got the reserves. And we tend to treat ourselves like we're a battery. That we can't focus on these big things until we have the energy, until we've got the time. So with vitality, what we do is we focus on the smallest micro moments. And we start to help people notice that when you use those smallest micro moments, like the talk that Carly and I had in that little pot, like that little piece of energy gives them energy to do the next thing. So vitality is about bringing it forward to the smallest micro moments that give you a bit of energy and watching, helping people watch the way that energy gives you more energy. So I know that happened when Carly sent me that little photo of the pot plant the next day, right? She's using that little energy to create more energy in her group. That's the little V, if you like. So you're not a battery. You don't have to wait for a recharge. You need to think of yourself as more like a renewable resource, that the more you use your energy, the more energy you create, like a windmill. The more you spin, the more energy you create, or like wind. So when I start to think of it like that, I start to notice the way even watching a little YouTube clip can start to increase my energy. It can, it, and it might be outrage, but it still can increase my energy. And with DNAV, we want to help people channel that energy. And so what we want to do is we want to put your energy into moments that matter from the smallest micro moments and not wait until you're fully charged, but consider in self instead the way when you put your energy into something, it creates more energy. So that's the first step. <clears throat> and I'm going to walk you, this is a, from the, our book, What Makes You Stronger, we created at the end of each major, um, each chapter, each piece, we created uh, like memes to help people think about and remember what they had to do. So this is the first meme, put your energy into vital moments and valued action. And we give that to people to take home and stick on their fridge. Put your energy into vital moments and valued action. That's step one. <clears throat> then I'm going to walk through step two is being able to be aware of what happens in our body and our feelings and our experience of being a person in the world. And we kind of have two extreme ends that we can go to. We can be controlling, reactive and unaware, what I referred to earlier as the dark side, or we can help ourselves with small strategies to become open, accepting, aware and connected to other people. This is like a continuum, you know. We're just trying to push ourselves further along and we go back and we come up. So we use the smallest of strategies to help people do this. And the um, small strategies could be something like finding a small moment. Pause and exhale where you are right now. If you're alone, bring all your attention to what you can see and hear outside of you. If you're with someone just notice that person talking. Pay attention to their face and be curious. And say to yourself, be here now. Small, tiny, micro moments is what we build in here. And the steps that I can do when I am outraged and when I am stressed and worried about what's going on in the world is pause when I'm upset. Take a breath and name what I'm experiencing. Notice others and be aware that others are in this with me. That small moment gives me breathing space and it gives me connection and it gives me the ability to not be reactive to what's going on inside me. And it can happen in a group and it can happen in an individual. So these little pieces can be the tiniest little pieces that we can do in a group. 
And I'm just using my personal example as the way to make it real. So the little meme that we created is notice inside you and notice outside you. Just be aware of what's going on inside. Pause and take a breath. Say, this makes me really scared and angry. Notice outside me, be aware of the other people. I'm not alone, we're in this together. One more to stick on the fridge. Then we go to the tangly place that we call your advisor. So your advisor is just a word that we use. We can use any label you want, but it helps not to call it thinking. Um, it's, it's the word that we use for how we give ourselves advice so that we can navigate our context. And our context here is all of our past, all of our anticipated future, all of our physical world, the groups that we're in, and how we use um, language like rules, beliefs, judgments, evaluations, predictions, problem solving, all of the navigation mindy stuff how do I work this out and we use a continuum where you can go from being cognitively rigid and inflexible to yourself and others through to becoming more flexible and this continuum is just an arbitrary way of thinking about where am I along this spectrum and how do I move myself up and there are a few steps involved I'm just going to show you one step because I want to make it really easy. Step one is being able to see your advisor. See it. That's why we call it your advisor, so you can see it and see what its job is. I'm going to give you an example of how I might help someone to see it. <clears throat> when COVID-19 started, way back I always use a practical example that people get um, in their own lives. When COVID-19 started, what did you think? When the plane started stopping, when the world's closed down and stopped, what were the things that you were telling yourself inside your mind? Maybe people will write in the chat or even unmute and tell me that would be really nice. I think we've got time for a bit of interaction. What did you tell yourself? What did you think? when the plane stopped, when all these things that we've never experienced in our lives started to happen. I can tell you what I thought, this is going to end badly. This is going to go badly. Catastrophe. Oh, Paul, you thought it would blow over soon. Love your advisor, Paul. Who else? <laughs> You did you? I did. There was part of me that thought that too. I thought, oh, this will be like SARS. You know, it, it was all a big drama and it's going to disappear quickly, right? Paul's advisor, it'll blow over soon. My advisor, after, after it will blow over soon, and then when the plane started to stop, I was like, this is going to be a catastrophe. I was ready for the rest. I was glad. Yeah, people had that too. I was glad you could pause. I thought it felt like the end of the world and I was worried for my kids. Me too, Felicity. This is all what we call your advisor. Is it really that bad? Perfect, Lou. Yeah. Trying to work out what's going on. It's going to bring out the worst in us. I was with you, X-Men. I thought, is it going to be like, are we going to fight over this? What are we going to do? How are we going to work this out? And then there's all those parochial things that happened as planes started coming and people started bringing, bringing it to different parts of the world. And we brought out the worst in us, you know, blame, blaming other cultures and blaming other people. <clears throat> and so the important thing is when you start to see the job of your advisor is its job is to predict what's going to happen and to predict what's going to happen. We have to use the current environment or our past. And fortunately, we're pretty bad at predicting. And fortunately, things often are different to what we expect. There's no way I thought the whole world is going to have a vaccine this quick. 
Um, and so that's why I use this image, just to think about what your predictions were and where we ended up. And there's this thing that uh, seeing your advisor is about understanding that its job is to predict. And we will more often than not predict negative because its job is to look out for danger, to see what might go wrong. This old evolutionary um, uh, adaptation that we have of predicting what's going to happen in the and where the danger is, where the physical danger is, where the social danger is. So starting to see it can really help you think about whether you need to follow those predictions. And that's why I showed you my dark side when I look at those things that are going on. My dark side of my advisor, my inflexible side is people are selfish. Money will always win. It's too big a problem. I can't change it. And you can even hear in my voice how rigid and fixed that gets. But when I practice some of these skills that we've been learning, and I'm starting to see it, I can start to add things like, my advisor is helping me. Those predictions are helpful, but they're not always right. My predictions are based on the past and where I currently am. I actually am pretty bad at predicting the lotto numbers for next Saturday. And important things like things I tell myself, like I can make a difference to one person and that's a place to start. When I tell myself I can make a difference to one person, suddenly I feel empowered. And so the three steps that we looked at with the advisor that to create a kind of meme for people to remember is see it, redirect it, and rule it. I'm not going to explain all of those today. I just wanted to help you see it. This piece of us that is so useful, like a superpower, your ability to predict and plan and problem solve, that is always on, that's mostly negative, that's always telling you what's going to go wrong next. Once you see it and see what its purpose is, you are empowered. You can use it in ways that help you become more flexible, pay attention to what you really care about and use it for putting your energy into what matters, not the dark side. So now we have three things that people can do. And we come to the fourth. Happens to be my favourite because I think it's the closest to adaptation and thinking about the way humans across time and mammals across time learn to manipulate the physical world. So we call it the discoverer. Some people get confused with that term. So sometimes we use the doer. And it's understanding the way we use trial and error to continually try new things, to get stronger, to manage our world, to manipulate our physical environment. When I think of the discoverer, I always think of a one-year-old learning to walk, to how they stand up and fall down and stand up and fall down. One-year-olds don't say, this walking thing is too hard. I'm not doing that. They keep trying. And that's how we adapt and something that we are really good at. So being able to continually try and find new ways to do things. The dark side is going back to our old responses, our old habits, staying in our comfort zone. We want to help people move up to trying new things. And this is an image I use a lot from our book. Um, and I really love this image because it shows exactly what we want people to do. Is it time to leave your comfort zone and discover more? So what I do with this image is I print it on a piece of paper and I, we work together as a group, in a group or individuals, what's in your comfort zone, right? And I love this picture because you can see, you know, too much wine, too much pizza, too much TV. You know, what do you do when all of those things are making you feel stressed? And remember when we first were in COVID, we did this stuff, right? 
And what you notice is after a while, that comfort zone is not so comfortable. And what we do is through that doorway is the discoverer zone. And what's most important is to be willing to walk through that doorway and try to find something new to do. You got to walk through those thorns and the unpredictability and it's hard and you don't know what will happen. But walking through that zone gives you the energy that you need. And it's about understanding trial and error, being able to make a mistake, to stand up and fall down. And humans are really good at that. So with my discoverer, when I start thinking about how do I put my energy into vital moments, I can start with new ideas like giving talks, writing resources, giving away what I can, where I can. And I'm listening to feedback about whether it's working or not. Paul's introduction for me today was like, wow, is that me? That's really nice feedback, Paul. Connecting with others. That's how I use my discoverer. How I keep trying to go, all right, Louise, get off the couch, do something. All right. So the small steps in this meme that we're trying to establish for the discoverer, explore what you yearn for. Learn how to take one bold step and learn how to listen to feedback from the world. That means feed, by feedback, we mean learn how to listen to did this work for me? Was this useful for me? Did it help me? Did it help me put my energy into vital moments and valued actions? So now I'm aware I've talked a lot about the individual, but all of these behaviours that we have are learned and developed in a social context. So when we look at the where they're nested, they're nested inside our ability to connect with other people that we call social strength. Helping people take a perspective on others recognizing our social interdependence and being able to use your behaviors, these behaviors, being able to use them in your relationships, in the groups that you live in, in the, in the context of bigger and bigger groups that we are all trying to live in. And if you use these four behaviors in this flexible way, then what you can end up with is finding more like, this is my example, finding more like-minded folks, like the folks here today, um, like the EVOS people that we, and the contextual behavioural science people, building our groups, taking perspectives, listening and connection. When I do that, my ability to use my advisor and noticer and discoverer increase my skill level. I get better at using them because I feel connected and supported and the best in me comes out. And the self piece, the self piece is um, looking at ways in which I'm not born with a fully formed advisor that knows how to predict and navigate the world. I learn how to use that as I grow. And how I learn it is from the social context in which I'm in. My thoughts are not fixed and part of me. I can change and learn different things. And so understanding that how to overcome our self-limiting beliefs, how to treat ourselves with compassion and kindness, how to see that I am the person who discovers it's a part of me. I am the person who gives myself advice. It's a part of me. And because I'm also a Buddhist meditation teacher, I throw in the Buddhist thing here because I really like to think about that. It's a nice way of thinking about ourself, empty like a container versus fixed like, fixed and thing like. And so this self and social piece is about helping us use our cultural and historical environment, how we've learned 
to, to notice in the world, how we've learned to use our own advisor through our attachments, intimacy, social skills, our social world and groups, and how we've learned to be a self. And when you add that, you get increased self-efficacy, seeing myself as stronger and seeing that each person matters, which means I matter. That's why that's in the self piece. So instead of being here, we can start to become more skilled at being here. So that's what we want to do. Is we want to be able to see the places that we go to. And notice that when I'm in this place that I've written here as the dark side, my ability to really think about what I care about and to do what I care about is not being maximized. But if you help me become more skilled at my four behaviors, then they influence my social world. They influence how I see myself and all of my energies are going into what matters. And then if we build that out, we can do the same thing with group processes. And I have very roughly put um, Eleanor Ostrom's core design principles inside each part of this DNA V disk. And they don't fit exactly in a one-to-one -one correspondence, but I thought it would be nice just to think about for people who are really familiar with it, what it might look like. And some of them I overlapped, like fast and fair conflict resolution. I put in noticing because it's connected to our emotional awareness as well as advice. It's really just a rough way of putting it in to think about it. And so what you have is one language for me as an individual, how I develop my behaviours, one language for the groups that I'm connected with, and then like my family and my intimate groups, and then one language for a group that we work in. Nested inside evolutionary science and using contextual behavioural science principles. I won't, there's references and I'll, I'll put the slides up. People want the slides and the references, that's fine. And then that's why I started with this today. Because I really love this. The measure of a wise, wise life is the imprint it leaves on others around it. So I think that leaves me as done. And maybe it's a good place for opening to questions. I might get rid of the slides. I can come back to them if we need them. But let's have a look at some questions. Okay. Well, that was so amazing. Um, so let's uh, please uh, raise your hands to queue up. And uh, my policy is I'm always the fourth to ask a question. So please, please, three people, ask questions. X. Do you want, do you want me oh. to call the people that put their hand up, or is that okay? Uh, well, say, if you put your virtual hands up, then then there's an automatic cue. So uh, so X, you're first. Uh, Leano is uh, is up next, and just uh, it'll automatically uh, cue if you just raise your virtual hands. Okay, excellent. Yes, Louise, that was absolutely awesome, uh, awesome, and I think that um, you've simplified it in such a way to reach uh, the audience that you're dealing with. And uh, as a medical scientist, I want to say that um, most of our approaches uh, tend to be focused on people with issues in, in, in health problems and so forth. And um, the DNA V model, um, and particularly the context in which you explored the DNA V, particularly the advisory, uh, works well when you have people with issues, you know, negative perceptions and so, so forth. But I was wondering, and, and the reason I'm asking this question is um, I'm trying to bring this to, the, to a business context to deal with businesses and help them improve engagement and so forth. And you're dealing with people who have a fairly, uh, who think the advisory self is, is quite, um, quite confident and you know, uh, spot on in predictions. How do you manage that kind of, I mean, I'm sure you'll find that among the students in your groups too, because a few of them might be feeling a lot more positive about what they're doing at that particular moment. And I'm wondering how you deal with those situations. 
Well, I love that question because you're totally on the money. <laughs> the, the more, uh, I think like the, the more intellectual we get, sometimes the more we think our advisor is always right. Um, and there's a rule that I, a little rule that I have is that never fight with someone's advisor because we'll just, you know, dig our heels in and get even more um, deeply embedded inside this. Who's right, my advisor or yours? So well, we never do that, right? We never do that. We rest inside um, a simple metric that of helping people to decide whether the advice that they're giving themselves is helpful or unhelpful. Um, and helpful means that it helps you connect with and do what really matters. And we mean what matters from a, I just always use a heartfelt sense because people understand what that means. Even if it sounds a bit cheesy, people understand what we mean by your heart sense and to do what really matters. And so uh, the question to ask ourselves is, am I using my language ability, which is such a powerful ability, Am I using it for what really matters to me and what really matters to the groups that I'm in? And if the advice you give yourself is helpful, then keep using it. And my experience is that for all of us, there's so much that we advice that we give ourselves that is unhelpful and unhelpful in terms of it doesn't help our groups and it doesn't help the, the real big thing that we want. It goes to that dark side of me grabbing and feeling to need safe because the task of language, of course, is to keep ourselves safe and away from danger. And I didn't put it in the slides today, X-Men, but um, I love the work of Alison Gopnik. Some of you may know Alison Gopnik's work um, where she looks at development across the lifespan. And um, her work shows, and sometimes people don't like this, but her work shows that as we get older, we get more inflexible with our cognitions and we're more likely to stick with a familiar hypothesis, even if it's not consistent with the evidence. And the most flexible age for changing your thinking is toddlers and teenagers. And we know that fits with adaptation, right? Um, across the species, what you see is that uh, risk-taking and sensation-seeking and all of those amazing things that happen in adolescence where they push the plastic and help us see the world in new ways. Um, and so whereas as you get older, you remember all the history and use that to predict what should happen. So I use those two things, helpful and unhelpful, or I just pull out some really good science that shows even though it's not likely to feel like it's you, you're more likely to stick with what you know and what you tell yourself as you get older and be inflexible. That usually pushes people into thinking, okay, how do I use more of this other one? <laughs> Great question. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Liano. Liano. Thank you. Um, that was amazing. I, I, I have not encountered uh, not encountered uh, DNAV before, and um, it, uh, it it really resonates with me uh, tremendously. Um, uh, I wanted to I wanted to ask you have you you, uh, you clearly have a have a full have a full fully worked out theory of the individual with this. Uh, you also have a fully worked out theory of of the group with this as well. Yes, we do, um, because the group and the individual are not really different. Um, as in the principles that we can use for a group are mm -hmm. the same as what we can do with an individual. Groups also get, in, like a, an, in X-Men's question, groups also get inflexible and, and stuck and think that they can't change things and, and this has to be this kind of way. And so we can use the same principles for the group as we do with the individual. So we've been doing that in schools and in um, uh, places where adolescents hang out in groups. And mm -hmm. it's really incredible because as soon as the group starts to get inflexible, mm -hmm. you know, rigid in their thinking, negative, then all of the stuff that you care about falls away. So it's actually the same principles because what right. we're talking about is a, is a really easy application of some really elegant theory 
yeah um you know of adaptation variation selection retention right i was um i was also wondering i and this uh, um uh have you have you tried or has anybody tried to map um, the uh, uh, the different aspect the different personality aspects that you're talking about here uh, to um, the um, um, the uh, embodied metaphors that George Lakoff uh, talks about? I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work or not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Um, um, can you can you put in the chat who that person? that person's name is you're able to do that for me Liano and I'll follow it up sure. um, yeah. so I, I probably can't speak to your point but what I can say is the reason that we create a personification if you like you know calling it your advisor or your noticer is just to create distance we don't really care you can use any words you want but we just tried to find some words that would allow us to create some distance and to see this behavior outside of us if you like because otherwise yeah, we get so we can't, you know, if you call it thinking, then I'm wedded to it. Yeah, no, I, I, I that that resonates with me tremendously because I, 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 lots of people here have heard me talk about how I really think that we need to we need to talk about uh, uh, culture in terms of collections of stories that interact with each other and evolve, um, and 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 this this is giving your internal story a set of actors, and I think that's that that's that's just right on. Well, wow, we're storytellers, aren't we, Liano? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I wish we told more stories because I think the stories are actually really speak to our heart and we remember them. Yes. So I think we, I think we, more stories would be really wonderful and help yes. us connect the data. And I see David has put in George Lakoff. I don't know his metaphors, but I'm going to follow it up. So thank you for helping me out yeah. with that. I'll put in some of his book titles. Right. Wonderful. I'll make sure I copy it before we close the chat down. Okay, Jordan, welcome. Hi, Jordan. Hey, Louise. Oh, you're you gone. Your... <laughs> so, where, where are you? There you are, down there in the corner. Thank you for your presentation. This is, um, I've, I've been familiar with DNAV, um, but haven't ever been to a presentation with you. And so it was good to, to see it uh, fleshed out more and excited to do some more work with it. The, I'm, my advisor is trying to decide, there's two different areas of questions, and so I'm trying to decide where to go with it. I think where I'll go is just something that's coming up. I'm a practitioner. I primarily use DBT, but I also use ACT and functional analytic psychotherapy. And I've been, I've really uh, been excited about pro-social efforts and thinking more about macro level change. I'm also, a, I'm a clinical social worker, so I'm like trying to figure out how I can do therapy for communities instead of my clients um, uh, because of the, what you said earlier, the sense of um, we focus kind of too much on more treatment instead of the social context. Uh, and so my, my question to you has to do with the EEMM, the, the EEM. The yeah. yeah and I, I meant to put in a, to do like a, um, post on the ACBS site, either in the process-based listserv or the general. But my thought as I see that, I feel like, and maybe this is true of DNA V2, I don't know, but I have, I have a desire for there to be more uh, in that model than just the social context, based on what I've learned from the, the pro-social worldview that, um, the social context is so, and based on my practical experience with clients who we do a lot of robust work together and, you know, they, they're no longer self-harming, they're no longer suicidal, but they're still super lonely and super disconnected. And the, in, there's just not institutions maybe or social context that, that in the same way that there used to be for, for many of them. And so I've been really um, drawn to pro-social and what Mavis is doing with her ACL Global Project, what Tony Biglin is doing with Values to Action and thinking, you know, what are the ways to scale these things outside of the clinical office? But I'm wondering what your thoughts are with the EEMM model. Is that a fair criticism that we need to stretch that social context tab out, whether that's the CDPs or something else to be really assessing, even in a clinical session with one person, 
to really be assessing, are they involved in groups where there's other people with shared purpose? Are they in, in groups or structures where there's, and how to empower them to, to start um, interacting, using their skills to make change in those environments to create uh, their own pro-social contexts? Well, um, that's a great question, Jordan. Um, so the aim is not an application. It's a theory. Um, it's not an application that, that you could go out and you're not going to go out and do an extended evolutionary meta model theory uh, therapy with people. It's, it's, a, it's just a way of putting together all of the pieces that are theoretically um, appropriate. DNOV is an application. It's a framework of how to put it all together. Now, your question is um, kind of, I think, do we undersell the social stuff? Absolutely. I, I think of it like this. I just don't see people who come to see a psychologist and say, you know, I'm really well connected. I've got great relationships. People really like me. I feel really well supported. And I thought I'd come and get some therapy. That just doesn't happen. And every single person that we work with has feels alone or feels disconnected or feels unloved or feels that they're not supported. And that, so that happens at the individual. And then when I look at the groups, the groups that I work in like schools, the problems are always feeling not that people don't belong, that they, and we're not working together as a group, feeling afraid, feeling intimidated, feeling scared, feeling isolated. And we can just keep building that out all the way to the planet like David did with his book, This View of Life. And so I think we undersell social in everything. We, are we in my View. we take our individualist culture and we apply individual to everything we do and it's not helpful so i think pro-social the pro-social movement is so important and so helpful and so that's why dnav had social always embedded inside it and why we nested your four abilities inside a social context because it came from um looking at development across the lifespan and when i look at a child you can't look at a child without looking at the context you can't look at a teenager without looking at context and as it turns out you can't look at with an adult without looking at the groups that they belong in so yeah. so i think yeah. yes we can do it so uh so great uh and so much number, to uh, number four david <laughs> hair, yay. Uh, and i might bring paul in on on uh on this one uh, so much to ask and there's so much overlap so i mean everything that you've said about the importance of um, of um, of the social context. Uh, one way uh, I put it in the article with Jim Cohen that I just put on the chat is, you know, I mean, if an ant is separated from the ant colony, um, what you need to do is put her back in the ant colony, not give the individual ant therapy. So, so when we really are quite a bit like ants and colonies that way. But I wanted to um, focus on the differences between. DNAV and ACT in a pragmatic sense. Um, uh, and, and so I think that, um, I mean, they're, they're aligned with each other, but they're also different in important ways, such that we might really, you know, prefer DNAV over ACT in, in some contexts, or maybe even all contexts, maybe it's superior in all ways. So help me and Paul, maybe you can join in, understand the difference, the, the, the major differences between DNAV and ACT and also at the same time, it was like a separate question, but similar. I'm just eager to know how you actually work, for example, with a young person when you deliver this. Um, and uh, uh, just to get a feel for how this how this works in a therapeutic context. Sure. Um, so um, it is ACT, sort of. Uh, it's a hard question because like what I really think is more that it's more than the hexaflex, um, which is the ACT model that lots of people know. But the but ACT is more than the hexaflex too. And ACT has changed over the years. But if you go back to what ACT was when it was originally developed and it was six core principles around what humans do when they struggle, when they're suffering. Um, whereas DNAV was focused on when we started it it was focused on how do we help people adapt and grow in a way that's helps them thrive and so we kind of took what we knew in act but 
in my opinion, we broadened it out and we started to talk about evolution and we started to talk about those ways in which um, we know that humans adapt and grow um, and how those principles might help us, variation, selection and retention might help us. So it is act, it's a different way of looking at it. And I think it's, I think what's happened with the hexaplex is that it's narrowed people um, and I'm, I don't want to use hexaflex, not everyone knows this, but it's kind of narrowed people into just looking, getting stuck inside that. And so it's just another way of broadening it out. And what I really think is this is contextual behavioral science. So that's, I don't know if I answered that question in a way that's helpful, David. But that's well, let's see, uh, Paul's up next and Paul, you can either uh, we'll take off the on that part. or... or uh... Or not, but uh, let's be. Oh, let's you had a sec. I, I, I completely agree with everything Louis just said. So I have nothing to add. I definitely see it as a manifestation of CBS. And I wanted to congratulate you, Louise, for just. I mean, you can really spot when you've, when you've, when someone's managed to weave together incredible depth with application and practice. And uh, so, just feeling a great sense of appreciation for that. So, this is definitely an expression of CBS very closely allied with ACT, if not the same, but an expression that's extremely helpful. I do have a question, but I think you had a, a second David question, had a second but... part. David yeah. had a second part to the question. Well, I still, I'm kind of what I, I want to... Oh, how uh, I use it with a young person, that was your question. Well, yeah, but also I think, you know, in a very, very practical sense. I mean, Paul just said that in, in our current training and one of the one of the cohorts, we're using DNAV rather than the ACT matrix and it's working great. Uh, but there's a difference there somewhere. Oh, I can um, answer that question so, so, about the ACT matrix. At the, I didn't realize you were talking about the ACT matrix. So the difference between the matrix and DNAV is DNAV is about skills development. Or, so I call them abilities. Sometimes we call them skills, like your advisor ability, your ability to use your mind, your language, whatever words you want to translate that to, um, is about the skill that you have. So that's a, an ability that a human has. And um, what we want to do is help people become more skilled at using that ability. So when we talk with young people, we often call them skills, your four skills. Um, when I talk with adults, I tend to call them your four abilities. And so what we are doing here is using a whole range of evidence-based processes to help people become more skilled at using that ability. So I simplified, let's say, noticing my embodied awareness, being able to use my feelings, my senses, my experience in the world. We call that being a noticer. And we drilled it down today to two simple things. Notice what's going on inside and notice what's going on outside. And helping people become more skilled at that. Um, the matrix is, the way that I see the matrix is it's more like a, a sorting tool but it doesn't it doesn't necessarily attend to how skilled you are at okay. using something like noticing um so inside noticing we'd have acceptance um understanding of reactivity understanding ways you respond to the world and it can get much more and more complex all the way out to when people self-harm and we want to help them practice soothing and you know all all the different ways in which we can be a body and okay okay that's so that's the way i see it i see the matrix is more like a tool a very useful tool but more like a tool and this is more like a an understanding of the skills that you have and helping you become more skilled at using those skills Okay, that's great. That's helpful. Uh, Paul, did you have more before we uh, turn to Delphine? Um, no. Thank you. <laughs> I, I mean, I do have a... <laughs> no, I don't. Okay, we have, we have time. We have 10 more minutes. So, uh, so Delphine, hello. Hi, Delphine. Hi. Thank you. So um, I, thanks, Louise. I've heard you speak about DNAV before, and I use it um, with my clients. Um, but I'm not familiar with the pro-social movement. And I'm wondering how do you bring this DNAV to the, like you say, multi-level systemic kind of uh, practice that you've been doing? Yeah. Well, I think we're still new at working out how to do it. Um, and I think we've met before, Delphine. I feel like we've Yes. Um, yes, I've been to your training. Yeah. 
So welcome. Um, so in, um, I'm going to go back to a book. So we wrote a book in 2015 called The Thriving Adolescent. And that was the first, our first publication on DNAB. And the last couple of chapters are on using the core design principles and um, using DNAB in a social context. And we use two social contexts. One context is the immediate relationships, our intimate relationships. And that book is with adolescents. So it was using it in, you know, families, parents, siblings, using it in, with um, our close and friendships, our close relationships. And then in the last chapter, we described using it with a group. And there are several discs, that disc that I used, looking at the kind of behaviours and the kind of ways we respond. So if you want to think about groups, I think that's the, the best way to read those couple of chapters. I'm happy to share them with you if you email me. I'll put my email in the chat here. If you email me, I'm happy to share those chapters with you and you can think about how you might do it. But what I do is um, I begin by talking with people about exactly what we did today. I begin by talking with people about all of the ways in which we can go away from what really matters. And so in a group, let's say a classroom, I'll make it practical. If I'm working with a classroom group of kids and we're there for a reason, there's something we're there and we care about. We might begin by talking, putting that disc on the blackboard or whiteboard and talking about what we care about, right? And kids will say things like respect, being able to be heard, all those things that they care about. I don't get too caught up in, is this a value or is it not a value? It's just like, what are we here for? What do we care about? And then I will ask the group what happens when they um, try to be involved. Like what happens when you put up your hand to ask a question? And I'll ask them in a number of ways. What do you notice in your body? And they'll say, you know, my heart starts to race or I feel a bit scared. And what advice do you give yourself? And they'll say, say things like, people will think I'm stupid. Don't put up your hand. People will laugh at you. It'll be dumb. Um, and then the, um, I ask them then what they do, how they respond to these inner sensations. And their response is, that we call the discoverer could be that they might withdraw completely, not never engage in the group, pull away, or be impulsive and act out. And so we follow that same kind of pattern that I did. And usually when I work with teenagers, it's fun because I say to them, all right, so here we are, we're in a group, we connect, we, we care about what matters in our heart is we care about being able to be a group together, being respectful, listening to each other and working for our common cause, whatever that may be. Let's say it's being a team, right? And then I'll say to them, now I know it's not you, but when you go to participate, tell me what your friend's advisor might say, what thoughts they might be having. And they'll say, oh, yeah, my friend might think other people think I'm stupid, right? And so we, we bring it out. We bring out all the information in that kind of way, much as people do with the matrix tool. And if you, you, you don't do pro-social, but much as people do with the matrix tool. And then we, we begin to think about how do we use our skills, our abilities, our four abilities in ways that help us stay connected to the thing that's in our centre. That's why we put values in the centre. What's in the centre of you? And even when I talk about that dark side, it's just a, a metaphorical way of speaking because the truth is that when we, even when we're in that inflexible place, we're trying to really do those behaviours like, uh, you know, if I'm shutting down and withdrawing, it's really because I'm trying to protect myself based on what I care about. But we're just trying to help people become more skilled and use it in a way that helps them. Does that make sense? I'll send you, email me. I put my email there. I'll email you those couple of chapters and it'll help you think about. But I think we've got a lot more work that we can do in how to do this with groups. And I've been talking with Jim and Jim Lemon in Scotland and saying we need to write some papers and some practical applications of how to do this with groups. And that's probably what I need to do next. Thanks for asking the question. Delphine. Thank you. Yeah, Thank that's you. great. Thank you. Uh, Eliano and then Paul. Um, I was just going to say about uh, the question that David asked. Um, I just, I'm just going through the pro-social leadership training and we just did the ACT matrix. 
And the problems that I saw a lot of people have, I think would actually be solved uh, very well if we did uh, some version of the, of the DNA V first, because it tells you, it, it gives you uh, clear ideas about how to do what the, what the matrix is asking you to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Um, I think you're right. The matrix is a really good tool when you have a, a discrete behavior that you're trying to change, such as how do we work together as a group? Um, but if you can you can get lost in the weeds, people not really knowing what to order in a way is and getting stuck with not having the skills or the abilities not being maximised. Yeah, I think you're right, Leano. Great feedback. Thank you. Good feedback. Paul? Thanks, Leano. Yeah, I yeah. just want like to unpick with you, Louise, a little bit more the difference between self-context and advisor. Um, and I think what you're saying is that the the advisor is more the guidance elements of our languaging and the self-context is more the sort of response elements of our languaging. Um, is, is, is that, uh, are you seeing the context elements as kind of um, not areas of direct intervention and the, and the middle pieces as the places where we can work? Um, could you clarify that a little? We, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it gets a bit tricky with people who know self as context from, from the ACT world. So at the, at the simplest level is I um, see the social context and the self context as containers. Right? That's why we did that image. It's like a container. And so let's say with a child, right? I, a child is born into the world and they're born already with the ability to notice what's going on around them. You know, we know from the minute they're born, they're able to seek eye contact and um, uh, and reach out to other people and connect with other people. And how those people connect with them is part of that social context, you know, our attachments and our intimate relationships. Well, over time, as we grow, all of those things build on until eventually we start to feel like a self-identity in terms of our body and who we are and how we feel. And I'm going to switch that into language. So when a child starts to learn how to use language, the parents are speaking for them. You know this bit well. Parents are speaking for them. You need to sleep, right? You're tired. You need a nap. Until eventually, by the time you get to 18 months old, you're like, I'm not tired. I don't need to sleep, right? That's a child learning how to use their own language to navigate their own context. And we call your advice, giving themselves advice. I'm not tired. I don't need to sleep. And the way that I see the self is through like millions of repetitions and the way we use language and our sense of being in the world is eventually we become a self through all of those actions. Like we, it's the way we use the word self in our, in our, in my context my culture is that it feels like self is a thing so the reason that we created that um, container for self and social based on what, how act do it with self as context is we wanted to get a sense that yourself is nothing more than thousands of repetitions of being a discoverer standing up and falling down of noticing in your body how you feel of telling yourself what to do. And through thousands and thousands and thousands of repetitions, you eventually come to create a, an identity. And that should be seen as like a context. So my self is not a thing. My self is the way that I've learned to use my DNA and V across my life. And it changes. It changes. And so at the simplest level, I often refer to talk to people about changing one small thing and seeing how much it changes how we feel. Like change your name and see how much it changes how you feel. But you're still the same person. So that's the way I see it. So it's much like the self as context piece that you know in ACT, Paul. Um, so can I ask uh, a social. Up? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, I mean, as a skills model, you're laying out a set of four skills or a set of six skills? Um, ah, yes, I see where you're going. Four skill. So what we do is we separate it into two. We separate 
for the four skills as your foundation. So you really just need to know those four skills. Mm -hmm. But then you need to apply them to your social world and you need to apply them to your sense of self. So, yes. So in um, What Makes You Stronger, we, um, ha we, we split this book. Half of this book is self and social. But the first four, the first, we, we start with four chapters that are your foundation skills. And then all we do is take those four abilities and we then apply them to the social world. And then we apply them to your sense of who, how you see yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not just uh, the, how you, the, the labels that you give yourself, but it's also things like um, understanding the vulnerabilities inside your body from growing and attachments and learning and your history across time or your biological threat and safety, all those things. So yes, four things you need to learn and then you apply them to the social world. You apply them to the uh, your sense of self. Great. Thanks very I think much. it took me a long time to get to that answer. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> okay. No, it's all right. My question maybe wasn't so clear either. No, no, no. no uh, Delphine, is you, uh, have you raised your hand again? Oh, no, sorry. Didn't put it down, I think. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Alex so. Alexander put in a, a long question here. No, I'll just, I'll just, I don't know John's work, Alexander, but I will copy the chat and I'll follow it up. So, thank you for that information. Oh, good. Great. Okay, great. Well, we are at time in another wonderful, wonderful seminar. And I just feel so grateful to be on this journey with so many people and, um, and to uh, be catalyzing change as we are, including the diversity within us and how positive we feel about different methodologies, basically. There's, I think there's zero threat level in this talk as to you know, my method versus your method. That's how open-minded it all it all was. And so, uh, so uh, that's just uh, a sign of our health, I believe. So uh, with that, we continue. And uh, thanks to everyone. And we'll see you all. I'm not even remember who's on next week, but it will be great. So, uh, so thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone for inviting me along. Thank you, David, and for the great questions. I really appreciate it. All righty. Thanks, Bye -bye. David, can I just ask thanks, you Thanks, Louise. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Can I just ask you not to cut me off so I can just get the um, the chat, those few references? Okay, fine, fine. So we'll be tuning out now and then uh, uh, yep, we can everyone save the chat. Yep. And uh, uh, Lou, you uh, you did the recording, I think. So, uh, yeah. so that's great. I'll just wait till the voice okay. is finished. Won't be a second. And I think yep, I've fine. got some nice, gives me some bit of homework to do. All righty. Thank you. Thanks everyone. for inviting me along and thanks for the great questions, folks. Okay. I'll try to come to more of these seminars. It was fun. All Thank righty. you. Bye -bye. See ya. Bye.